All right, I guess I'll get started. Hello, everybody. <laughs> um, all right, so this is Git Wrangling, advanced tips and tricks. So hopefully everybody in the room has used Git or uses Git currently, because if you're not, uh, you might be a little bit confused at many points during this presentation. So um, I, I'm, I'm expecting a certain amount of, of uh, knowledge of Git going into this. So Real fast, let me introduce myself. My name is Scott Anthony Chacon. Um, I work at GitHub. Um, these are some of my Git-related projects. If you go to github.com slash schacon, it has a whole bunch of, I'm sort of obsessed with Git. Um, I run gitsem.com, which is the sort of official Git homepage. I maintain this, so if there's anything seriously wrong with it, send me an email, let me know, and I'll fix it. Um, I wrote the Git, I wrote the peep code PDF, Git internals peep code PDF. Um, and the APRESS Pro Git book, which is open source, so you can get all the markdown uh, source for the book at progit.org, or at GitHub, but you get it off progit.org, and you can read it all online at progit.org. So it's a pretty good reference. Um, I might be a little bit biased about that, but uh, I think it's a pretty good reference. So if you want to learn more about Git, you can read that. And that's my Twitter, and that's my email. If you guys have any questions or anything about Git after, I'd be happy to help you out. Um, all right, so that's me. So. For those of you that, if you just accidentally wandered in here and you don't even know what Git is or what I'm talking about, I'm going to do a Git in 60 seconds overview to get everybody up to speed. Um, if you already know Git, then this may be somewhat redundant, so um, bear with me. So Git, what is it? It's an open source uh, distributed version control system implemented as a directed acyclic graph of commit objects, pointing to snapshots of content with all data saved in a custom Content addressable file system by the SHA-1 checksum hash of each object's content. So branches are simply pointers into this directed graph of commits that identify entry points that designate work on that branch, allowing Git to traverse the pointers, determining a coherent history. Um, it makes branching cheap and easy and merging simple, encouraging nonlinear development styles and frictionless context switching while... <laughs> while facilitating distributed development, cryptographic integrity, and late decision making. <laughs> Nearly all commands run locally with uh, no network overhead, late, no network latency overhead, and it's implemented mainly in C, which makes it uh, very fast and efficient even for large projects, which is why a lot of large open source projects use Git, um, not to mention the quarter of a million repositories and 175,000 developers on GitHub alone. Um, so if you're using a version control system that is not Git, you might want to consider using Git. So that's it. OK. Thank you. <clears throat> so this talk, now that everybody's up to speed on what Git is and are very familiar with the basic command sets and whatnot, um, we're going to go over a couple things. I'm going to go over some data mining techniques, some data munging techniques, um, some debugging tools that you may not uh, use or have heard of, um, some ways to customize Git, and some new stuff in Git 166. So like the brand new one that was just released a couple weeks ago has some new cool stuff in it. So I'm trying to go over all that. I don't know how far I'll get. I tend to talk kind of fast, so I might do it. But if not, um, uh, we're drinking tonight at uh, the Malt House. So come over at 7 p.m. and we'll buy a drink. All right. Uh, so this is going to be kind of shotgun style. I'm just going to throw this stuff out, out at you to see what sticks. Um, data mining. So Git has a ref log. So every time you're doing stuff in Git, it's recording um, what is happening on, on your, your current head, on whatever you're doing. So as you're doing commits and as you're doing merges, it remembers where you've been. So if you uh, do a rebase or something, or you lose some pointer, you can use the ref log to see where you've been and get that back. So there's a couple cool things you can do with that. Um, if you type git ref log, you get an output that looks like this that shows you where your head has been the last however many times, as, as long as you've had the, the project, basically. I think it, it gets rid of them after about uh, three months or so. Um, but you can see that I checked out, you know, I moved from my master branch to my local branch, my local branch to my master branch. I did some commits. I did a move from my master branch to my local branch. You can see all that stuff, right? So you can always see what you've been doing in the past. Um, you can also look for uh, what you've done on a specific branch. So if you have an HTTP proxy branch and you say git ref log show that, you'll just see movement on that branch, stuff that had to do with that particular branch. Um, if you want to see if that's not very useful output for you, you can use git log to show you the same information. So you can say git log dash g. And that will show you the ref log information, but in the log format uh, file or format output. So you can actually get a little bit more information about that. If the ref log is too sparse for you and you want to see the authors and the dates and stuff, you can use git log-g 
and uh, a branch name or head or whatever, and it'll give you the ref log information in this format, which I think is really, really useful. Um, and it also gives you a couple shortcuts. So you can say git ref log some branch at three gives you where that was three times ago. So that's completely local. It's not going to be the same for everybody using it. Um, but if you want to say head at three, that's where your head was three actions ago. Um, and you get some specific commit, right? So you can do like check out some file from that particular version or something. It's kind of a handy little uh, shortcut. Uh, but the other cooler thing is that you can do date-based stuff. So you can say uh, my, my HTTP pro proxy branch one week ago, what commit was that, right? So you can say if you want to revert some file to what it looked like a week ago, you can say git check out, you know, master at one week ago, and then the file name, and it'll, it'll check that out into your current working directory. Um, so you can revert files that way, uh, which is kind of nice. So that's ref log, um, really quickly. Um, some advanced log stuff. So if you guys just type git log and that's it, there's some really cool stuff that you can do with git log to mine your data and look for specific commits or ranges of commits or see where stuff was changed or something. So we'll go over some of that. Um, formatting wise, I think this is very helpful to actually see lots of, of log output data without having each one take up 10 or 12 lines. Um, dash dash one line is, uh, if it's an older version, you have to do dash dash pretty equals one line, but the newer ones you can just do dash dash one line, and it gives you output that looks like this. Um, so you just get one line per commit. Right? So instead of having a really verbose output, you can get a, a much shorter output, um, which is helpful when you put it in conjunction with dash dash graph, which gives you um, your, your commit graph. So you can see here, I only can actually see two commits, but I can see what, that one of them was a merge commit, and that the, the, if you page through it, you can actually see what was merged in. You can see your lines of development, much like you can see it in git k or something. Um, but if you put them together, then you get a more useful output, I think. I think git log dash dash graph is not really that helpful, but in conjunction with one line, it's really helpful. And dash dash decorate will tell you where your pointers are, where your branch heads are. So if you put them all together, you get something that looks like this, which is actually really helpful output, right? So I have an alias for this, and I'll do this all the time to kind of see what my history is looking like, um, at, you know, my recent history has looked like for branches and merges and stuff. Um, but so that's some, some helpful log format. Um, there's also ways of subsetting logs, so in case you don't want to see all of your history, but you want to see some range, this is useful for answering some questions, specifically, um, what do I have on a branch that I haven't pushed yet, or what is um, on origin master, what, has pe what have people pushed in the meantime since I've been working that I haven't incorporated yet? Those are very helpful answers, or uh, questions to answer, or what's on one branch that's not on another branch is really what the question is. Um, but you can do ranges this way, so if you do two SHAs or branch names or anything that will, that will resolve to a SHA, and you put two dots in between, it'll show you everything in between, right? It'll show you every commit reachable by the second one that's not reachable by the first one. And so that's kind of confusing, and I never remember this format, but if you think of it as old dot dot new, like if you do origin master dot dot master, that'll show you all the commits that are included in master that are not included in origin master, right? Um, so, or you can think of it this way, it'll replace head on, on if it's missing a side if you want to, so you can say everything since a particular commit. But the way that it works is through reachability. So if you're using Git and you don't know about sort of the reachability of your commit history, I think it's a really, really important concept to, to grasp, to learn Git, uh, to use Git well. So if this is what your history looks like, so you do a commit and you do a branch and you commit and commit and you do a merge, right, where just master is, that was a merge, but you keep working on that branch and you merge it in again later, um, you might have a history that looks like this, where master's the newest one, and jest master, you know, you pushed to your jest remote at some point, right? Um, so if you wrote, if you typed git log jest slash master dot dot master, what it's going to do is this. It's going to find everything reachable by master, which means it takes that commit and just walks its parents, right? It can reach any parent by walking, uh, it can reach any of these commits by walking the parents, by looking at what the parentage of each commit is and walking down. So all of them are reachable by master. Um, by doing the same thing on just master, you can only reach those four, right, just by walking the parents. Um, so the, the difference is that. So if you type git log just master dot dot master, you'll, get, you'll see those six commits. That's everything in master that's not in just master, right, or everything that you've been working on that you, since you pushed to your just remote is, is really the question that that's answering. That's a really, really helpful syntax to know because it lets you see, if you're working on a whole bunch of topic branches, it lets you see what commits are in topic branches that you haven't incorporated into your master branch or that you haven't pushed to your, your server and shared with people yet, and it, it's a really helpful um, way of answering that question. And there's another way. You can just put in a SHA or something if you don't have a branch head there, and it says, 
okay, here's everything reachable by the one, remove everything reachable by the other, and that's the, the difference, right? That's the, the set. Um, so you can do, this is some really common way, things that you'll do or that you'll see done is you say get log origin master dot dot. That means what's on my current branch that I haven't pushed to the master branch of the origin server, right? What have I not pushed yet? And that'll just show you the three or four commits or however many since you last pushed. Um, and that is equivalent to that if you're on the master branch because otherwise it assumes head. They should be the same thing or they're often the same thing. And this is actually the same thing as well. And I think this is a more useful syntax even though you'll see the double dot stuff a lot. Um, which just says git log everything on master, not on origin master, what's not reachable by origin master. And why this is useful is because you can do several of them. With the two dot syntax, you only have one and, and two, and you can only see the difference this way. This way you can say, I want to see everything on my master branch and my experiment branch, my topic one branch, that's not on my origin master branch or my just master branch or something like that, right? Um, so for instance, um, this is like an Android type thing, M cupcake, but if you have uh, you know, if you pulled from your some main Android server and you started doing work on a default branch and you branched off of that and did some more work in an experiment branch and you came back to your default branch and did a commit and then you did a git fetch and pulled down a bunch of commits from the, the, the canonical repository, then you might want to say what changes are in an experiment. What commits do I have across all my branches that are not in my experiment branch yet, right? And so you can solve that with this, this uh, syntax. You say git log m cupcake which everything reachable by M cupcake, uh, everything reachable by default, and I want to see everything that's not in my experiment branch yet. So it basically goes through and removes all the commits that are reachable by that, and you're left with this set, right? So if I merged in default and I merged in M cupcake, then those would be the four commits that, that would modify my, my uh, tree, right? So it's a, it's a helpful syntax to know. All right, um, there's also filtering you can do with log in addition to this. Um, to, to, to weed that down a little bit. Dash dash author, you can filter on an author name. So you get log dash dash author, uh, either the name or the email address. It, um, partial on either of them works fine. Um, since and after are the same thing, just different ways of doing that. But you can say everything since some date. You give it like a date in there. And it'll show you only commit since then. Um, until and before is the opposite of that, right? Only stuff before that. Um, and again, this is all, uh, uh, th those are the same thing until and before. Um, grep searches through the commit message. So if you're looking for some specific phrase in the commit message, you can do that. Um, all match will take the author and grep, and there's actually dash dash committer if you're looking just through the committer data. Um, by default, when you add those, if you say like dash dash author Scott and dash dash grep some phrase, it'll look for any commit with either of them. Um, if you want to look for any commit with both of them, then you have to do dash dash all match. Um, and that, that changes the, the way that it does that. Dash dash no merges, this takes out merge commits if you're not interested in them. And dash dash all searches all of your topic branches, all of your local branches. And finally, at the very end, you can do dash dash and just by itself, and then it, it get will uh, figure that everything that comes after that is a path limiter. So then you can say like tests or something, some directory, and it'll only show you commits that modify files in that directory. So putting all these together, you can find pretty much any commit in, in any Git repository relatively quickly if, if you don't remember exactly where it was or what the SHA was or there's nothing pointing to it still, right? So that's a very, it's a really helpful way of sort of data mining your, your Git repository. So this is an example. You can do, um, you know, author Gitster. So everything that Junio uh, modified that between 2008, uh, between October and September, or basically in the month of October, take out all the merges and I only want to search the test directory and it shows me the, the six commits that match that criteria. So, pretty helpful. Okay, the other really cool thing that, um, I don't know, has anybody used pickaxe here? Pickaxe functionality? Oh, pretty good amount, okay. I never get anybody that raises their hand to that, so. Um, but you can say git log dash capital S and give it a string and it will basically search through the diffs of all the commits for any line that, that that modified a, uh, any commit that modified a line that had that string in it. So if I want to see where P4 merge, any commit that introduced code that has the string P4 merge in it at some point. So it's not searching the commit message, it's searching the code that was modified itself. Um, and I can do this and I can see in the git source code that there were three commits that introduced the phrase P4 merge in it somewhere, right? And so that's, that's helpful for me if I'm looking for a P4 merge strategy. Um, so that's, that's pretty helpful. Okay, so, branch diffing. Um, a common problem with people that don't understand the, the way that the diff stuff works is you want to do something like this. Let's say that you have a master branch and an experiment branch, where you have three, since you diverged, 
You have three commits on a master branch and one commit on an experiment branch that are unique. And what you want to do is you want to see what is on your experiment. You're on your master branch. You want to see what is on your experiment branch that's different from your master branch, right? So you want to diff basically your master branch and your experiment branch. Um, and basically, you want to get you want to get this. You want to get the 16 lines and nine lines here because what's on your experiment branch is just that one commit, right? So that's that's basically what you're looking for. But if you run this, which is sort of what most people try to do, and this works fine if it's a fast forward, if one's a direct ancestor of another, but if they've diverged, then what it's going to do is it's going to say that it thinks you're asking, how do I make the master branch look like the experiment branch? So it removes everything that was added in the master branch and then adds everything that was added in the experiment branch, and it gives you something that looks like this, right? Or this is what you're looking for. Um, what, it, what this will give you is this. It'll remove everything from the master branch that was added in the master branch add everything that was added in the experiment branch, and that's really confusing for a lot of people. It, gets, it, gets, it just looks like you're just removing tons and tons of content. Um, so the way get, get, gets around this, basically, is the triple dot syntax. So you can say get diff master dot 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 experiment, and what that does is that calculates the, the first common ancestor, it calculates the merge base of the two, and then diffs the second argument with that merge base, right? So it's everything on that one, one side of the equation, and that's more generally what you're looking for. So if you run that, then you just get those two files, not, not removing everything from the master branch. It's a helpful syntax. All right. So data munging. Um, commit amending, this is a really helpful little thing. If you guys don't use this, a lot of people do. But if you just want to change your last commit, if you did a commit and you misspelled something or you forgot to add, forgetting to add a new file is a really common one, and you did the commit, and you don't want your second commit to be, I'm a dumbass, I forgot to add this file, that's what your commit message is, which are half the commits that I have in the GitHub code base, um, then you'll want to do this. You, you can just say, you can get, run git add, and then git commit dash dash amend, and it just replaces your last commit with a new one that had the, the whatever your new staging area looks like. Um, if you want to do, um, the, how many, does everybody use rebase here? About half? Okay. So really quickly, what rebasing is. Because rebasing is really confusing to a lot of people, so I'm going to go over real quick what it actually does. So if you have, if you're on a topic branch and you want to merge in the master branch, right, to keep your, so your topic branch is up to date with what is on the master branch or what is on origin master or something, um, what you can do is you can say git merge master and that will merge in the master stuff and you'll be up to date with that um, and that's fine. But the problem is if you're working on an open source uh, project and you've submitted, say, a patch series and they haven't accepted it but they've accepted other work, and you do a git fetch and you get all this new commit stuff down, now your stuff is out of date. And you don't want to merge that and then try and send them the patch series because if there's a problem, they have to deal with the merge stuff themselves. And that's really annoying for, for project maintainers. So what you can do is you can say rebase master. And what that does basically is that takes the, the branch that you're on, which is the green arrow, the branch that you're putting after rebase, which is the blue arrow, and then it calculates the first common ancestor, the merge base. And then it takes every commit from the merge base to the one that you're on, which in this case is two, and it creates a patch of each one. So it basically does this. It diffs each one with its parent, creates a patch file, sticks it on a queue, um, or on a, on a stack, and then does that for each one, right? So I have one to two and two to three, and then applies them, pops them off the queue, and applies them onto whatever you did as the, as the argument. So it says, okay, takes that one and applies it there, and you get you know, C2 prime or whatever, and takes that one and applies it there. And so what you end up with is a linear history instead. Right, so it just re rebases some some line of work. It's sort of like a patch queue. It rebases some line of work to, to some other point, um, and so that's very helpful because then you can redo your format patch or whatever and send your patch series off. Your new patch series that that the maintainer now is just a fast forward. It's you know there's no they don't have to do any merge work. You've already done the merge work for them. So it's a very helpful tool. That's why it's around. But there's some really cool things you can do with it because you're treating your series, you're treating your topic branches like a patch series, like patch queues. Um, and so you can do cool stuff um, like rebase dash dash onto. Um, so, you, so for instance, you can transplant topic branches. So if you have a couple commits and you created a, a branch because you're going to do some server work and then you decided you need to do some client work as well, so you made a branch off of that one called client, you do some commits, you go back to your server branch, you do some more commits, you go back to your master branch and you do some more commits or you pull down some work or something. So you have this. Let's say that you want to take C8 and C9 and you want to move them to your master branch and push them up, right? The problem is that C3 is a common ancestor, and you don't, you, or is, is in between that mass, the, the common ancestor is C2, right? So if you actually say 
get rebase master on the client branch, what it's gonna do is it's gonna see all three of those and it's gonna try and move all three of those over and that's not what you wanna do. You wanna leave C3 where it is. So if you say get rebase server, it calculates the right, um, it calculates the common merge base of C3, it calculates the right uh, commits to do, but it's going to move them on top of server, which is not where you wanna move them. So what you can actually do is, um, actually, I think I have this wrong. I think it's get rebase dash dash onto master server, but um, either way. If you do this, it'll use, it'll use the normal one as how to calculate the patch series and then the other one as where to actually transplant them and you can do that, right? So it'll move those two series over, and leave the other three there and then you can just do a normal checkout server and rebase master and it takes those three and move them um, onto the end and you have a nice linear sequence. So you can use this, if you're just, the, uh, another cool way of doing this, I do this to clean up messed up histories a lot, like if uh, a, a GitHub client had some some really horrible thing, they have a, a, a some, some corrupted object that they introduced or something and they wanted us to help them with it, I'll, I'll do this to, to move some stuff around, but you can do some really nasty stuff this way. So you can transplant topic branches this way, so if you have a, three commits on a topic branch and you only wanna move two of them, or if you have 20 commits and you only wanna move 19 of them and not like the first one, um, what you can do is you can drop a topic, or you can drop a branch somewhere, so you can say get branch, new topic, and then the SHA, and that drops a, a branch, and then say rebase new topic onto master, and then that'll just move those two, right? So you can just throw a pointer in somewhere and then take everything from that pointer to where you are and move them somewhere with this, with this technique, which is kind of cool. And you do that multiple times and you can really, you can really move around a, uh, a history. Um, another cool thing, patch staging. So if you run get status and you have, say, a file modified, and in that file there's a couple sections of the file modified, and say you only want to move the two scheduling, you only want to move the comment here, you, only, you want to do a commit that just has the comment, and then a second commit that has the code, the code changes, right? Um, uh, this is common if you have like a bunch of white space changes, like, like this is almost kind of a good, good example, um, but if you have like a bunch of white space changes, and then like two lines, like 100 lines of white space changes, and then two lines where it actually changed uh, the way that the code works, you might want to do those as two separate commits so that it's easier to code review for somebody, right? So that they're not just lost in white space changes. Um, but you did it all at one time, so you can use git add p to stage them separately and split them into multiple commits. Um, so what you do is you say git add p, and it says, okay, here's, your, here's the big hunk of work, um, and it says stage this hunk, and you can say yes or no if you want to stage all these changes, or in this case, there's two separate um, sections, so you can actually do an S for split, and I'll say, okay, do you, want to, do you want to stage the top part of this hunk or not? And you can say yes. Do you want to stage the bottom part of this hunk? You can say no. And then if you sit, run get status again, you can say, you can see that file in both the staged and unstaged um, parts, right? So you run git commit, and it, it'll commit just the top half of the file, and then you can run uh, git add and git commit, and, it'll, and then that'll commit the, the second half of the file as a, sep, as a second commit. So you can use add-p to sort of split up stuff and take like a weekend's worth of work and make you know, five commits that all make sense logically. Logic, logically separate change sets. Um, okay, so debugging. So there's some really cool debugging tools um, that Git has as well. Um, Git blame is a really good one for figuring out who is the last person to modify some specific line in a file, right? So if something's going wrong, you can say, okay, who did this? And then it's you, and then you don't make an ass of yourself. Um, so if you just say git blame daemon.c or whatever, um, you'll see some output like this. this. is very similar to like SVN annotate or something if you guys are used to that or have used that in the past. It just gives you the last commit to modify that line and the person and the, the time of that commit, right? the author and the time of that commit. So that's fine. Um, what git can do that most, um, that most systems can't do is it can actually do stuff like this. You can say git blame dash capital C which says look for copies and it can go through a file, so in this case, git pack upload.m used to be git server handler.m, and I refactored it into two different files, one of which was git pack upload. And so what it's doing here is it's saying, okay, all this code in the middle here is new to git pack upload. So after I did the refactoring, I added that code. So that's fine. But this stuff down here, this was copied from another file, right? So I copied functions from another file into this file and did a commit. So instead of showing me when I, did, when I did the copy of the code, it shows me the last time I edited those lines in the previous file, right? In the file that I copied them from. So, um, so, so you don't mask stuff when you're refactoring 
code. If you leave off the dash C, then you'll just see when you copied the code over. If you add the dash C, then you'll see the last time that those lines were actually changed. Does that make sense? It's pretty cool. I don't know of any of the systems that'll do that. Um, bisecting as well. Okay, so bisecting is a binary search for where a bug was introduced, and I, I use this about once a month probably, and it's amazing. Um, what you do is you say, get bisect start. Um, so, so let's say you're working on some code, and you have a bug that you've introduced, or that, that you've noticed. Maybe, maybe, not that you introduced. You have a bug that you noticed, and you didn't see it before. You know it wasn't a bug at like version 1.0 release, right? You know it wasn't a bug, because you tested for it, but you don't have unit tests, or they didn't work, or something. But you notice there's a bug, and so you say, okay, there's been like 100 commits since the last time I know this wasn't a bug. So what commit introduced this bug? And the way that you do it, is you say, get bisect start, and that starts the bisecting engine. It doesn't really do anything else. And then you say, um, get bisect bad, and that marks um, your current, it marks head as bad. You can also say, get bisect bad some specific commit or some branch name or something, um, and that'll mark that commit as bad. And then you say, get bisect good, v1.0, or a SHA of a commit that you know is good, or something that, that will find a single commit that it can mark as a good point in, in your history. And then, it takes every commit that's reachable by the first one that's not reachable by the second one, so whatever the, what every commit that could have changed the tree to introduce that bug, and it lines them all up chronologically and topologically, and picks the middle one and checks it out into your working directory. And then you can run the test, right? So you could run a unit test, you can run a script to test for it or something, or you can just test it manually, which I've done before. And if it's good, if that bug is not there yet, then you say, get bisect good, and it says, okay, that's fine, I'm gonna take the difference then. So everything before that is also assumed to be good. I'm gonna take the difference and I'm gonna check out the middle one and I'm gonna put that in your working directory and you can test that now. And then you say, oh, the bug's here, so this one's bad. And so it takes the difference again. And so if you have 100 commits, you can look through all of them um, this way very quickly, right? Even, I mean, it, it's, it's, you can have thousands of commits and you can still go through it relatively quickly. Um, and you say, get by set good. And eventually it runs out of options and it says, okay, this is the first commit, um, this is the first bad commit. It has the SHA, this is the commit that, in, that the first commit that we can find that actually has the bug that you're looking for. Um, and if you're us, it's, it's relatively obviously the PJ Hyatt, but if you're not working with PJ, then it could be anybody and this is a really helpful tool. Um, and then at the end you say get bisect reset and it resets you back to wherever you were before you started this whole process and you just have the information of where the, where the bug was originally introduced. The other cool thing about this, um, I don't remember what the, what the exact, uh, uh, I don't remember exactly how to run it, but you can say get bisect run and give it a script, and that if that script runs and exits zero or non-zero, if the bug is there or not, then you can just say, here's the bad commit, here's the good commit, run this script, and it will automate this process for you, and just go through, and then at the very end, give you the SHA. All right, so, customizing Git. Um, autocorrect, so this is kind of a cool little thing. If you say, if you type something, and I do this all the time, you do like git com, and it says, this isn't a command, I'm not gonna do anything, which is kind of cool, but um, I do it all the time, and so um, a lot of times it's like status where I'll switch to S and the U or something like that. Um, if you set help.autocorrect in your git config stuff, then it will try and figure out what you meant and run it, which you may like or not like. That may scare the crap out of you, I have no idea. Um, but, uh, but if you say git config dash dash global help that autocorrect one, then instead of doing that, then it'll do this. It'll just say, okay, I assume you meant commit and it's gonna run it for you. So you may not wanna do that, I don't know. I, I've had it on for a while and I haven't had any problems with it, but I, I actually like it because then I don't have to go, ah, I'm an idiot. Okay, um, colors. Um, if you're just starting to use git and you wanna turn on colors for everything, you can just say config dash dash global color dot UI. Dash dash global for, if you don't know, um, there's, git config will take uh, two different commands, or two different um, uh, switches for this. It'll do global, which, yeah. Yeah. Oh, I didn't know that. So that's a timer. So help that autocorrect, you can give it a number of seconds um, that'll let you say no. Oh, tenths of a second to let you say no. Well, that, why would, well, I, I can usually respond in four tenths of a second, so I'll set it to five. Um, <clears throat> all right, so 
uh, color.ui true turns on coloring for everything instead of it, when I first, or you know, back in the day you used to have to set like three different variables for stuff, but um, you can just do this and it turns everything on. It's pretty cool. Um, so that's nice. And the true, instead there's like false and true and always, I think. And uh, true will do the color codes if you're at a terminal, and it will not do the color codes if you're redirecting it into a file. So it's usually the best option. Um, diff and merge tools. So if you guys like to use external diff and merge tools, um, Git has some nice ways of setting that up. So you can set up like a custom diff tool. So if you want to use Perforce as your diff tool, um, you can set up this, uh, git config dash dash global diff dot, oh, the thing I was saying before, dash dash global means it's going to put it in your, you know, tilde dot git config file so that it's true on all of your projects. If you leave off the dash dash global, it'll just set it for the project you're in when you run it. And if you do dash dash system, it'll be system wide for all the users on the system. We'll put it in Etsy git config. Um, but anyways, git config dash dash global diff dot tool says I want to use this tool as my diff tool. And then once you have that set, you can just run git diff tool anywhere that you would run git diff, and it will launch the GUI with, I mean, you can give it the same arguments and stuff that you give git diff, but it'll launch a GUI instead. So you can use a GUI to, to or not even necessarily a GUI. It can be, um, it can be uh, I'll show you some examples of, of stuff that you can use. But you can also do this with merge tool, right? So um, if you run a merge and you have some merge conflicts and you want to resolve those with a merge tool, a, a visual merge tool, instead of um, doing them by hand manually, you can set up some merge tool like this. So for example, P4 merge now. And then um, when you run git merge tool, it'll fire that up and do it. So you, again, it, it, you have to run git diff tool or git merge tool. It won't do it automatically. It doesn't overwrite diff. But, um, but you can say, I want to use the visual tool right now. And the same thing with merge. You can still do it manually if you want to, or you can run git merge tool, and it'll fire up the, the visual thing. Um, so some examples. Um, these are some of the ones that you can use for the diff tool. Um, if you want to, or the, I do, or the merge tool, I don't remember. They're slightly different. What, what it'll use is the git tool or the merge tool. I haven't actually used any of them except for P4 merge, um, but, uh, and only that was because somebody specifically asked me for it. I don't think I've used any of them in actual production. But if you like these, then, um, then you can set these up as your diff tool or your merge tool. And again, you just run git merge tool when you have a merge conflict, uh, conflicted merge state, and it'll fire it up and let you resolve it with the merge tool. So that's pretty cool. If you want a non-supported merge tool, if you have some other merge tool that you really like, you can also set git up to use that. Um, if you look at the git config file, so this is an example of using an external merge tool. Um, you have to set up three different things to do this. Um, trust exit code just says whether it exits zero or not zero if the merge, uh, if you're happy with the merge, um, which some of them don't do. But then it has some variables that you can set to, you can tell it to run in, in this some specific order. Um, I don't know if you guys use anything other than what's supplied. There's like 10 or 10 or 12 commands that we will recognize. And it basically, the, the only difference between the external ones and the ones that it, that it, uh, that you set up this way, or the external ones and the ones that it supports is just that it's hard coded. It already knows what, what variable order it uses. Um, okay, git attributes. I, I'm curious to raise your hands. How many people have used the git attributes file? Okay, so git attributes is pretty cool. It can do some fun stuff. It's basically saying, so for some pattern match, right, for some, some, some path um, pattern matching, I want to treat those files somewhat differently by default. Um, so for example, you can use it to diff binary files. And the way that you can do that is by giving git a filter to run binary files through and then diff the output of that filter, right? So you can say something like this. I'm oh, sorry. You can say, if you run git diff and you have some PNG files, normally you'll get something like this. It says binary files A and B differ. You're like, well, that's incredibly helpful, git. Thank you very much. Um, but there's not very much that Git can do about that, right? So what you can do is you can tell it how to make that out, make those PNG files something that is diffable. Um, and the way you can do that, for example, is you can run it through exif tool first, right? So if you run exif tool on an image, then you get output that looks like this, right? So this is diffable. If you run this on version A and version B of an image and diff that, then that's actually kind of useful. Um, so the way that you tell Git to do that is you say start.png, I want the diff tool to be the exif strategy, and put that in the .git attributes file. And then you say what the exif strategy is. And so for this, you say diff.exif.textcom is exif tool. So that just says run it through exif tool first, and then diff that. And then if you run git diff, instead of saying 
A image and B image differ, it gives you this, right? So it's a, this is actually useful. You can see that the file size um, got bigger, and you can see that the dimensions of the image changed. So it's kind of cool. If you really, really want to do something weird, you could run it through like, like an ASCIIFI thing and dip that, which I've always wanted to try. Um, you can also, a, a useful one sometimes is strings, like you can do uh, like dot .doc through strings and then do the diff of the strings output of lots of different binary files, works pretty well. Uh, but anyways, it's, it's, it's useful if you have a lot of those. Um, some other things that you can do with, with get attributes are filtering stuff. So you can set up filtering strategies. So an example is there's a smudge filter and a clean filter. So if you have a whole bunch of files and you set up a filter for .txt in your get attributes, and you set up a smudge filter and a clean filter, then all of the contents of those files, everything that matches, so just the txt files, will go through the smudge filter first and then come out into your working directory. And then when you, when you do a checkout or when you switch branches, when you commit, they go through the clean filter into your staging area, right? So, um, so you can do stuff like, wow. Um, so you can do stuff like, like that sort of stuff, right? You can expand an RCS keyword if you want to do that, or um, I've done this to, take, to look for files that were really, really huge, and instead of storing the contents of the really huge like .movie file or something, instead of storing the contents of that in Git, you store like a SHA, um, like just a, a, blo a small blob with a SHA that says, look, looked at you know, S3 or something and download this content before you check it out in your working directory. So you can do stuff like that. But as a simple example, expanding a, a date RCS keyword, you can do, run a, a script like this, right, to, to just find a date that is relevant and put it into that dot dollar sign date. Um, and then you just say, I want my dater filter. Again, this is made up by you, whatever the filter strategy is. I want my dater filter smudge to be this expand date program. <clears throat> and I want my clean filter to be this Perl script, right? And that will clean out the date and put it back in as dollar sign date. And so, even if you go into the file and you manually change anything in that dollar sign date, anything in between there, you can manually, manually type stuff in, you run get status, and it's not going to show up as changed because it, it ignores everything in there. It runs it through the clean filter before it compares it with what's in your, your index. So just a quick example. Um, if you put that, that string into a, a file and then you say, all right, everything with date star dot rb, I want to use the dater filter on it. And then you, you, uh, you add both of those and commit them and just remove the file and check it out again, then you can see that there, it's going to stick that in there, right? And if you modify that and you run git status, it's not going to see it as modified. And I think this is finally for this. You can set up aliases. So um, if you say alias dot whatever you want the alias to be, so, so sort of adding a new git command, uh, and say, I want, instead, if I type git lol, I want it to do git log dash dash one line dash dash decorate dash dash graph. And then if you just run that, it looks like a git command, right? Git will see that as a command. You can also, I think if you put a bang in there, you can have it run like, like bang git k um, will execute git k. It can execute something that's not, that doesn't come directly after git. So you can have it run external scripts that do stuff. So if you have some branch, you know, some, some, some script that goes through and looks at branches and stuff, you can say run some external file instead when you run git this. Um, okay, so finally, so I'm almost out of time, new stuff. So in git 166, there's two things that are of note, I think, that are kind of cool. Um, one is git notes. Um, so git just added a mechanism where you can add comments to any commit without modifying the commit. So for example, if you want to add a signed off by or something and not actually have to rewrite the commit, because if you change the message, then it changes the checksum, it changes the SHA, and that screws with people. If other people are working and have based work off of that, if you want to go through and comment on some commit that's in the history without actually modifying the commit itself, Git now has a, a notes um, engine. So you can say, if you run git log and you have a couple commits, for example, and you say git notes edit and give it a SHA, then that will open up an editor for you and um, give you sort of the commit data so you know what you're commenting on. And you can add in you know, a signed off by, or you can add in you know, this commit doesn't look very good, or something like that, and, uh, and just exit that, and that'll add it to your notes. And then if the next time you run git log, it'll add this little note section at the bottom and just have whatever people have added in as notes. So 
Um, example of this, I mean, you, you can come up with whatever examples. We're, we're considering doing this sort of stuff with the, um, on GitHub for the comments on commits, you know, just having them in there so you, get, you can see them in Git itself, which would be kind of cool. Um, but, uh, but anyways, pretty cool. That's brand new. <clears throat> and you can also say git notes show in some, some SHA or something that resolves to a SHA, and it'll show you all the commits or all the notes for that particular commit. And the second thing that's really cool is the smart HTTP transport. So right now you can do read-only um, stuff over, well, you can do actually either, but unauthenticated access over the git protocol, so git colon slash slash, and you can do basically everything else over the SSH protocol. Um, <clears throat> but now there's actually a smart HTTP transport, so you can do authenticated stuff over HTTP, and it's not, right now you can do some pull stuff, but it's really slow, it's very inefficient, and you can do push, but you have to set up like web dev, and it's horrible. I can't imagine any, has anybody actually set up a web dev push? Awesome. Okay. Um, so, uh, yeah, my, the, the last, uh, when I worked at Reactrix, my friend um, Nick actually wrote all of that web dev stuff for the company that we were working at. And, uh, and then we never ended up using it at that company, and I mock him semi-daily. Um, but, anyways, so now there's a good way. There's a good way of doing it. Um, you have to have git, that you have to have git 166 at least on the server that's running it. The old git HTTP, you didn't actually have to have git on the server. Now you have to have git on the server because it, it will run uh, git upload pack and git receive pack. It will invoke them. Um, but uh, but you, you can, so it's basically the same as the git transport, except you can use Apache, like you can use basically any web server standard authentication mechanisms um, beforehand. So you can do all the normal authentication, and it's just as fast as the Git protocol. Basically, there's only a little bit more overhead, um, and it's pretty cool. So you'll start seeing this a lot in the future. GitHub will implement it relatively soon, um, and kernel.org already has it, I think. I don't know if they've uh, told anybody about it, but I think they are running it. Um, but basically, you just do this. You, you stick this into your Apache 2.x config file, and that's it. It'll, it. As long as you have the right version of Git on your server, you can hit that, that uh, HTTP URL and um, it'll invoke the git stuff and it'll, it'll talk to it properly and you can do pushes and pulls over that. Um, if you set this up, it's going to be unauthenticated, so you, can, you have to set up some basic auth or something around that URL, but that's basically how you do it. It's fairly simple. It only works on Apache 2.x servers, though. Um, there's, there's, it's CGI based and only works on Apache. So um, I wrote a Rack implementation, so if anybody uses Ruby and has Rack, it's like a Python whiskey sort of implementation. Or, or type of thing. Um, so you can use this to do the same thing on any Rack-capable rack web server, which is basically anything. I've even used Warbler to do this and put it in like Tomcat, right? So you can, you can run it in basically any web server. Um, but those are, your, those are your options for that. And this is how you'd run it, like a simple rack up thing for, my, for Rack. Um, but Apache is just those three files. So anyways, if you guys are running your own Git servers, um, you can do it over HTTP now, which is pretty cool. Okay, so that's it. Um, some resources real fast. GetSEM.com uh, is the sort of official Git website. You can get all the downloads and stuff. ProGit.org is the open source book. Git and GitHub on IRC are pretty good places to get information. My email address. Um, the slides are at bit.ly Git Wrangling. Um, they're pretty close to the same slides. And Malton House tonight at 7. Thank you very much. We have a question. I can repeat it if you want. Ah, what's that? Yeah, that's. It's difficult to do. I, I did 43 minutes. Um, yeah. So I mean, get. So he asked. He was asking me to get rebase dash i, which is an interactive way of doing rebase. So you can do any of the stuff I was doing there. You add in a dash i, and it'll show you all of the the commits that it's going to rebase somewhere else and let you say stop here and let me modify it or squash these two together or squash all of them together into one big commit and, and let you change the script of what it's going to do, which is very cool and powerful. Yeah. Yeah, so basically the rebasing stuff, I guess I didn't mention this, the rebasing stuff is best to do before you share it. You're not supposed to rebase anything that, it, that anybody else has seen, 
right? So you work on a topic branch, and then you use rebase to clean it up or to move it somewhere else and push it out. But if somebody may have merged that work in, then you tend not to rebase it. If you do that, you can, you can still push it. You do like get push dash F, that'll force push the branch up. But um, it's, it makes life harder for other people. So you need to, everybody that's working with you needs to know that you're going to do that and know how to, because usually then they have to rebase their stuff on top of that. And it gets really, really confusing. If it's for like an open source project, it, you know, I, I wouldn't do that unless you know that everybody knows what they're doing. But, I mean, you can't do that. It's just everybody needs to be good at rebasing. And if everybody's not good at, good at rebasing, then they merge stuff, and they forget, and they push, and then, and then you merge their stuff in, and you get all your old commits back that you had just rebased, and it's, it's horrible. I mean, it, it can be done. It's just everybody needs to know how to use rebasing, and it's, it's a somewhat confusing uh, command. Yeah? Get add I is get interactive. Yes, the difference between get add P and get add I. Get add I is an interactive mode, which is that. Um, from get add i, you can choose a menu option that goes into get add, what get add p is. Um, but then there's other stuff you can do in get add i. You can, you can stage files. Like you can say, I want to stage files 5 through 7, and it gives you a menu of all the files and stuff. And there's a bunch of stuff that you can do with that. Um, uh, it's sort of a whole staging management system, get add dash i, like this whole interactive staging management script. Get add dash p is one subsection of that that is by far the most popular. And so you can just, most people just run that, because that's what most people find most useful in it. Yeah. Yeah, so he's mentioning TIG, T-I-G, which is a NCURSES um, based sort of GUI for, for, for doing a lot of Git stuff. Git K is actually also very good. It's a tickle to K. Git, Git K and Git GUI, Git GUI, are both, actually, you can do a lot of stuff in Git using those ones. Git K specifically is very, very helpful and works the same on Windows and Linux and Mac. And so it's, it's a pretty nice tool to use as well. Not entirely sure how to repeat that. If you have a local branch and you never want to push it back, you want to make sure that you never push it back to uh, an external repository. I, I, I don't think I understand what the question is. We, I think we're out of time, so we can talk about it after this. Um, thank you very much. And there's stickers up here for GitHub if you want to do that. And uh, thanks. Thanks so much. Hey. Hey. Nice to meet you. Oh, sweet. Oh.